this table, you would be the guest speaker today. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it just, it, it all depends on where you sit, right? <laughs> Timing is everything. Uh, I actually came here to, to listen to my good friend Bob McDonald, uh, and now I'm your guest speaker. Uh, and Bob and I have a lot in common. Uh, we're both Irish, obviously. We're both Catholic. We both have five kids. Uh, there the similarity ends. Um, he's still in office, and I'm about to leave. As you probably know, I, I lost a very close uh, re-election battle uh, earlier, um, well, last month, uh, November 6th. I got 49.5% out of 40,000 votes cast. I lost by about 700 votes. And uh, I actually, the other, the two other big Senate races up here in Northern Virginia were uh, Ken Cuccinelli and Jean Marie Davis. Uh, I actually got more votes than Ken Cuccinelli. And, but he won and I lost. It just shows you the dynamics in, in close elections. We all knew they were going to be close. Um, and I, had a, I just had a terrible district, very tough time, tough to run this year with an R by your name. But politics is cyclical, and that was the reason you were going to listen to Bob McDonald. Um, what was the, head of the title of his speech? And I'll try to give you what he would have said. Uh, what's ahead in Virginia politics, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the one problem I have with Bob McDonald, my dear friend, we were elected the same day back in 91 to the House of Delegates. So I've, I've been a very close friend of Bob's ever since then. Uh, the problem I've got with Bob is he went to Notre Dame. And, uh, and you would say, well, Jay, you're Irish Catholic. Why don't you like Notre Dame? When I was a cadet at West Point, Joe Theismann was the quarterback, and they came and played Army at West Point and beat us like 77 to 7. <laughs> I kid you not. So I've hated Notre Dame ever since. And I hold Bob personally responsible for that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Navy beat Notre Dame this year. My, I, I don't have lasting grudges. <laughs> um, but let's talk about a few things that are on my mind. In fact, this is the first time I've, I've sort of talked publicly since my own uh, election. And, and there's a lot going on. In fact, when Megan was talking about new media, I spoke to a leadership group in Richmond uh, this past session. And one of the interesting questions I got was, what's the biggest change since you've been in office? So uh, this was my 16th session down in Richmond last year, uh, 07. And uh, I said, it's got to be um, the Internet. I mean, when I first ran for the House of Delegates, uh, we did not even have websites. I mean, think about that. That is so commonplace. In fact, Chris just pulled my bio off my website. That's, you know, we don't send them anymore. People just pull them down, download them. Uh, but, uh, and in fact, the, the way it, uh, it told itself, the, in, the impact of the internet was you couldn't lie to your public anymore, to your constituents. You couldn't say I'm a conservative back home and then vote liberal or moderate because everybody knows. They, you introduce a bill, they find out what it is pretty quickly by downloading, and there are, you know, interested groups that do that all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it was the media, or I mean the, uh, the internet, but more recently it's been the blogs and the fact that you're having a campaign school on how to, how to turn that medium into something productive in your own races is, is hugely significant. Uh, when I was first running back in 91, there was no talk about how to use the internet in your own races. That evolved as everybody started having access to it, but now YouTube, MySpace, how to use that. Produce your own campaign ads, put them on a website, try to get a buzz where it's picked up by the print media. That's all a process that we're at. And we try to call a blogger, even a Democrat blogger, hey, did you see what I've got? They'll put it on their website, creates more buzz. Um, uh, so, it, but it, as Chris and I were talking this at the table here, it works both ways. Um, what happened to George Allen on Makaka, all ginned and pushed by the blogs, also happened to John Kerry with the Swift Boat veterans. Remember that? I mean, if there is a story to be told and it's not picked up by the print media or TV, it can certainly get out there, but the problem with blogs is that they're anonymous. There is an anonymous nature to it. Uh, Tim Hugo, my delegate, uh, quoted a blog in one of his mail pieces. That became a front page story on the Post. Did you see that? 
where uh, he made reference to an anonymous comment on a blog. And people said, well, you can't do that. That's unfair. So we're breaking new uh, ground every year in campaigns about what is OK to use and what is not in terms of that. The two most significant things that I thought, that I, that I saw within this past year, uh, one I just mentioned was George Allen in the Makaka statement. Um, and, and he said it with a camera right in front of him. You recall that. But totally, I think, and, and I like George so much, but I think he underestimated the impact of that video shown time and again in a campaign environment. And then did, he failed to respond to the potential impact of that. Uh, and, and if he had, I think, a more forceful response to what he said, what he meant to say, but he let it linger out there until it was on Jay Leno, and then it became its own joke, and, and the, his difficulties really took off from that point. Here's another one for you. Do you remember the, um, what's that guy's name from Seinfeld? Michael Richards' meltdown. Remember that? What was his name? Kramer. Kramer. Uh, Michael Richards was the Kramer character on Seinfeld. And he was at a comedy club and had a total meltdown, a racist beyond belief. And it was, rec it, but here's the thing about it, it was not what he did or said, but it was all recorded by a cell phone from about 20 feet away. And you could see him clearly, and, and everything he said was heard very, very clearly. And that got on the blogs. Are you with me on this? So what got me was who would want to run for office anymore? It's every th you are on all the time. That's the key. And and I think for people seeing the impact of the Kramer meltdown and geez, how can I be sure I never say a bad word? Or I and, and by the way, uh, jokes and uh, <laughs> hyperbole. <laughs> Don't come across in print. You know the the tone is often lost. So you got to be very very careful about what you say and how you say it as a public personality, because sometimes it, it doesn't connect when you read it later the next day or something. Uh, certainly, it hurt George Allen. Well, anyway, I th I think those are very very significant uh, trends in politics, and I'm glad that the Leadership Institute once again is taking a. Uh, uh, a proactive role in teaching our campaigners how to deal with it. Um, let me ask you all, how did you get here? Uh, not by car or bus, but what got you here? And for me, it has always been Ronald Reagan. Uh, I was an Army guy, as you heard from my bio. Um, the, the things that you were talking about, college challenges, I didn't see a one of them. I was at West Point. <laughs> We didn't even have a beer. <laughs> uh, it, it, a different life, different living. Uh, but I got here, my own personal uh, attachment to the Republican Party came from Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, I, he said everything I felt. He put it into words. Uh, he got me hooked in politics. I was just a small business person in the early 80s, and I quit my job. Uh, in 84 and ha had a great offer to run the Reagan-Bush 84 race for Virginia. I was the Virginia ED and worked down, at, worked down in Richmond. It, it turned out it was a very easy job. Uh, I did not have to steer the wheel. I just had to hold on. Uh, Reagan, the great man, uh, won Virginia handily. And then during the course of the race, 84, it was whether he was going to sweep the nation. Remember that, some of you? Uh, just what a great time. Uh, and I've been a Reagan Republican ever since. The, the ideals, the demeanor of the man, uh, how he could articulate them, uh, no one has come close. Uh, and, and we talked, geez, was George Allen the next Ronald Reagan? Is Fred Thompson? I think the party continues to look for that kind of guy, man or woman. I mean, if it was Margaret Thatcher that kind of woman who could articulate the principles that we just n gravitate towards, but do it in a humble way that, that the independent voter can say, yeah, I like that. 
I was talking to Linda here about what's going on in Northern Virginia, and I, I think our, our problem is that we have statewide candidates who come to Northern Virginia, uh, the folks that I like immensely, but they're not clicking up here. They, they have a way of being a little bit stern, uh, a little bit too serious, a little bit hard sell in Northern Virginia. And, and, I, 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 and, and I'm talking about Mark Early, my, one of my great friends, Jerry Kilgore. Uh, and I watched, and I'm just talking about how they sell. I watched Tim Kaine come up here. He's from Richmond, but he, he's from Connecticut or something. But, yeah, he's in, but anyway, he comes up from Richmond. And, and uh, he has a, a likability factor that beat, beats our guys. Uh, Self-deprecating humor, glib, funny, <laughs> and, you know, gets, it gets away with it. And, and it connects not with the Democrats who hate our guy, not with the Republicans who are going to vote Republican, but with the independent bloc who can say, I see him as my governor, not that guy. And you see what I'm saying? And I think that's what's going on. So in our, and as George Allen and some of our other candidates have shown us, you don't have to win Northern Virginia but you better come close. And what what's happening, and I saw this with Ollie North, was Ollie North won seven out of 11 congressional districts when he ran for the Senate. But he got his clock cleaned up here in Northern Virginia. And then it's been, it's been happening since then. He was the first one where I really noticed those numbers were so deep here in Northern Virginia. So we have to have candidates that come at, can, can come to Northern Virginia, and I'm talking about our statewides, who can articulate a point of view that Ronald Reagan would be proud of and do it with a smile. And it can be done. And it'll resonate. And, and, and you could say, well, if it's so easy to do, Jay, why didn't you win? Man, well, we had it. The, boy, did they have the money. Oh, it was unbelievable. The TV ads. Everybody knew who I was. You know, I was on TV all the time, and I wasn't paying for it, let me tell you. And uh, I, did, I did do an ad that was great uh, talking about the media, which was um, uh, they had me, you know, and I'm, I'm looking this way, and I turned, and I looked at the camera like this, stern, like a can-do guy. So my kids, it was on the, the Redskins game. It was a Monday night game, and that my ad showed up. And my kids, we have TiVo. So my kids went back and forth with my head like a bobble dog, you know. <laughs> And they are pounding the table, laughing so hard. I said, all right, all right. It was very funny. Thank you very much. Um, but this was the first race where I went on cable TV. And uh, the, the amount of money that was spent in these elections up here, I saw it right away that, that the Senate of Virginia was going to be a bellwether kind of thing for the Republicans and the Democrats. If we could hold on to the Senate, we would be able to say going into 08 that notwithstanding uh, George Bush's uh, popularity or the war in Iraq, we still had the presence. If you stuck by your, stuck by your principles, you could still win. And uh, the Democrats also saw that. And they saw that if, we could, if they could win the Senate of Virginia, they could say, look, even Virginia is turning blue. Look at that. And uh, they funded that message. They were really out to get us. And, uh, you know, even my good friend, my dear friend, Ken Cuccinelli, only won by, by 92 votes in a recount against a candidate who was totally unqualified for public office. And, you know, that was just the, the world we lived in up here. It was really, really tough. Um, you know, you know uh, what, what lies ahead? Uh, I was so pleased to hear about the number of schools that you have running out of leadership. Um, this past uh, my election, I had five volunteers from the Brownbeck race. It was the week after he had pulled out of the presidential campaign, so they were available. They came to my race out of nowhere, and what a joy it was for me to have that kind of talent and energy on my race. Uh, young people who have an interest in politics, who have a year or a semester to spend on these races, 
you, you will never have an opportunity like that again. So some of the stuff that you are doing uh, and, and that Morton's trying to, to show to you, it, you uh, it was the opportunity I had in, in 84, although I had already, I was 32 or something like that. But uh, if you have an opportunity to, to jump on a race and, and learn how it's done, it may be you running later on. Um, I, I keep going back to, to uh, the, the, my mentor who I, I, I met him one time, Ronald Reagan, uh, and, and there's so much about his kind of leadership and style as a campaigner and as a candidate and as an elected person that uh, I have tried to emulate in my own life. Uh, and it is sticking to your principles and having fun at the same time. Not too much fun because it doesn't come across, but having fun. Uh, and we did it in the race. We had a blast in our race. It was really terrific. We did a uh, Halloween uh, call, you know, a robocall. You know robocalls. Uh, they used to be hot technology. Now they're so abused. Everybody hates them. But we did a Halloween robocall where the chains were going and whoo, -hoo -hoo, and it was George Barker will raise your taxes. <laughs> it was hilarious. I mean, you know, we really had a blast. And you, I think that kind of stuff is fun. Uh, so I asked you uh, how you got here, and um, th that's my story. That's how I got here and why I did it and what a blast I had. Uh, what lies ahead? Well, f the presidential year coming up, I haven't got a clue. On, on what the Republicans do. Uh, one of the problems I've got is um, if the best we've got is hoping Hillary gets elected because by then people will realize, you know, that that's not a good thing. That, let's face it, is not a good thing. Uh, that's like saying it feels so good uh, when, you, to, when you hit your head with a hammer, it feels so good when you stop. Well, you know, uh, don't do it in the first place. But but the electorate is very fickle, and, and sometimes that is what it takes. But I said that when Clinton was elected and that he was reelected. I'm going, yikes, <laughs> what's with the, pe with the public? I don't know. Um, and, and I think that the, the big problem that we have is uh, if we're too strident, if we don't have, uh, we, we are the party of message. The Democrats don't have a message, so they twist it and are, are much more negative, I think, than we are. Uh, but they, they don't have anything to talk about. I mean, I haven't seen anything out of Congress since they took over. Nothing. Not a thing. But does that stop anything? You know, they just keep on going, blasting Bush and everything. We have to be, continue to be the party of messages, but I think we have to do a better job of strategic thinking, uh, marketing, and nominating candidates who are electable. So uh, that, that has me thinking about 09 in our three statewides, because, of course, in Virginia, we have governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general. On our three statewides, um, while I think it's important to have Northern Virginia represented on the ticket, it can't be anybody. It can't be just a Northern Virginia. It's got to be, hopefully, somebody that can articulate Ronald Reagan's message, because it, it continues to resonate. Believe me, it does. And uh, we have to have someone who can come to Northern Virginia and talk in a way that Ronald Reagan would be proud of. Because no one can duplicate the great man, but, but we can try. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's the job that we as Republicans have. Because it's a great, endearing message that people continue to, to like. But we've got to do it in a, in a very, very positive way. Um, that's sort of my story. Is that all right, Morton? And does anybody have any questions? Can I take a question or two? Yes, sir. Let's give him applause before oh. <laughs> Yes, sir. How was that a, uh... Last night I was at a post. Does that work? I was at a post mortem on the election from. Uh, the precinct captains in Drainsville, and it was interesting that a lot of them said that um, our guys, our, our constituents just didn't show up. Um, and a lot of them said they had good friends who were longtime Republicans who, for one reason or another, didn't even bother to vote. Democrats obviously did. Um, 
one of the things that was raised was that uh, there were two folks that went up here, Ken Cuccinelli and Chap Peterson, and, and both of them embraced the gun issue. Now, I know that's not a salient issue for a lot of people in Northern Virginia, but it is for some. And that's the sort of thing that will get people who think that way sitting on their hands. If you've got somebody like Jean Marie or somebody like you who is very solid on that issue but doesn't say much about it. So I just wonder if you have any comments along those well, lines. Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> it's funny because uh, Republicans are sort of all over the place, but, but they are made up of different constituencies, pro-lifers, pro-Second Amendment. Oh, the, the big issue was illegal immigration uh, in my race. Um, we decided early on in my race to focus on illegal immigration as the crossover issue. And in a way, if we had spent time on the Second Amendment, it, it would have taken away from the the single focus we had on illegal immigration, um, although I was endorsed by the NRA, and you know I had and we did mailings to that specific group. Uh, Jean Marie, I think, uh, tried to do, get the crossover vote in uh, and get into deep into the independent voter base by opposing uh, the Second Amendment in the way she did. Uh, and notice that she did not talk about illegal immigration, I don't think, at all. So each of the campaigns had a different way of doing it. I was much more out in front on illegal immigration than Ken Cuccinelli. He spent more of his time on taxes. Does that mean taxes was a better issue in this race? No. I think he had a better district, and he ran against a totally unqualified candidate. That's And that resonated. My opponent did go to Harvard and did have a Harvard master's degree. I mean, he was qualified. You know, I, I disagree with him on absolutely everything. But well, when it got to people voting, they didn't even... Yeah, imagine my embarrassment. I've been in elected office for 16 years and lost to a guy no one's ever heard of. What does that tell you? A, a woman said in the paper that if Mickey Mouse was a Democrat, she'd have voted for him. That was the electorate this year. And, and so it wasn't that issue. I mean, I tried to get into the illegal immigration in, in issue in a big way to juice my base, my R base, but also to get in a meaningful way into the, Democrat, into the uh, independent voter base. The Democrats, even those who agree with me on illegal immigration, are still going to vote Democrat. They just are. We didn't even mail to them. The D's had so much money, they mailed to my most ardent supporters. They had that kind of money. It was amazing. So uh, I, I sort of agree with you to a point. It, you know, in, in, in races, you have a message. And, and if you introduce new elements to the message, it sort of gunks up the works. But I think we did have a good turnout. Uh, on, on that point, though, uh, the R's, I don't know how many Republicans have left the Republican Party. But you're right, they're, they're just not energized. The Democrats are euphoric. They're breathing oxygen for the first time in 20 years. In fact, they're dizzy with happiness. Uh, and the, thi the thing they know is they've got to get, they've got to pick up all the marbles right now while they can because it'll go the other direction. So they're very, very good at it. And I think that as a party, they're much better about uh, winning elections is the most important thing. It doesn't matter who's running. We have, I think, as, as individual Republicans, uh, we analyze our candidates. If we as a Republican disagree with them on a fundamental issue, we won't vote. And with the result that, you know, by 700 votes, we lost my seat, we lost the Senate majority, we lost Senate redistricting because Republicans didn't vote for me for whatever reason. Yes, sir. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Um, yeah. you'll, you'll like this. I graduated from the Air Force Academy, and for the four years I was at the Air Force Academy, we beat Notre Dame each and every year. I sort of like it. Okay. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> I did not play football, so I, it's not attributable to me. You mentioned something about uh, President Reagan. I joined the military under President Reagan, and I left under President Clinton. Typically, that's enough said about that subject. 
But he was elected 23 years ago, before the blogs, before all the um, electronics and, and the modern age, as it were. Is his bar too high for aspiring Republicans because we have to be like Ronald Reagan? We have to have that message like Ronald Reagan? And if we can't obtain that bar, then 701 voters stay at home? Is well, uh, you know, even Reagan lost, uh, you know, when he first came out, you know, on the presidential uh, race. He was well known in uh, California when he ran for governor, but, uh, you know, he uh, ran in 76 and lost. And he finally won in 80. It took time for his message to resonate uh, and his style. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a standard that we can all aspire to. Uh, and, the, and the thing, the reason I mentioned Reagan was, of course, like, like you, Shaq, he, he got me interested in politics. And, but uh, I, I loved his message, but I liked the way he delivered it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there was just something about, you know, and, and in fact, uh, when he gave a presidential speech from the Oval Office, I would say to my wife, well, you've got to sit down and watch this. This will be great. You know, just anticipating uh, what he had to say and how he delivered it. You know, the way, you know, he just shake his head. Uh, and I, uh, because I love politics so much, uh, I analyze public speakers all the time to watch them do it. And to watch, Cl I watch Clinton and how he pulled it off <laughs> and how he got away with it. I mean, you know, literally. Uh, I watch my priest at church deliver a sermon. I love to watch people speak to see how they do it. To, you know, to see that connection, to see if people are listening, to see if they throw a humorous story in, to see what works. And, and so part of its message and part of its messenger. And, and so if you can, in your life, remember someone who has time and time again could deliver a message and never let the public down uh, in terms of how he did it. Man, that's something to aspire to. So there's nothing wrong with that. And, and, and the things he said are going to be true no matter what. Limited government, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, faith in God. I mean, I want to start you. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> so now I can tell my Notre Dame story. Uh, okay, if the, if the Army Notre Dame game was today, how many would you, of you would vote for Notre Dame? Vote for Notre Dame. How many of you would support Army? Yay! Okay, come on up, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I want to thank uh, Senator Jay O'Brien very much uh, for filling in here. And, uh, and as many of you know, it's our, our custom to thank our speaker by giving them one of the Leadership Institute's Adam Smith ties. And Bob, this tie was going to be yours, but, <laughs> but, but Jay O'Brien has earned it, and we thank you so much. Um, well, the, uh, the Attorney General has made it here, and uh, uh, I know that there are traffic uh, snarls all over town. If you were listening to the radio or local television this morning, you, you heard about all the, all the chaos. Uh, and B Bob has made it here faithful as, and as soon as was physically possible for, for it. He doesn't intend to make a speech here, um, but he's going to say a couple of remarks. And we thank you so much for the efforts you made to, to be here. He's a very good man, and, and you all know it's, and it's my honor to present to you the Attorney General of Virginia, Bob McDonald. Well, good morning. Actually, I was going to give a speech, but I know you only have a few minutes uh, to spare. I am so sorry. It took two and a half hours for a 40-minute drive, and uh, we did everything we could uh, uh, except break the law. So didn't figure that would be too good for me this morning. but. Uh, Good morning. What a great, uh, great institute. And Morton, uh, thank you for your decades of leadership for the conservative cause, and Helen as well. I uh, was with them uh, all weekend at uh, Conservative Ventures uh, right here in Arlington, in fact, on behalf of the Republican Party, and continues to train uh, talented young men and women uh, to go out and 
uh, do good work uh, for the cause of freedom and limited government and the rule of law, and uh, you're doing terrific work, Martin. I really appreciate uh, what you do. Uh, let me just say a couple things. I know Jay probably covered. I'm sure he told you good things about Notre Dame, so I won't cover that uh, since he's I already heard him covering all that. We're focusing on soccer, by the way, this year, in case you were wondering what happened to the soccer team. Both women and men are in the CAA, so... Let me just say a couple things. For you young people, and I see there are all, all kinds of young people, some with gray hair, some with uh, dark hair, but uh, uh, it is vitally important at this time in our nation where we are a nation with uh, very divided views nationally and nation conflict that we uh, renew and re-energize the fight for uh, limited government and the conservative cause. We've got much at stake uh, in uh, the Mideast and uh, the world at, uh, at large for the cause of freedom. I just got back from Israel. My daughter just got back from Iraq. And so this fight for freedom abroad is really personal to me. And I think we all ought to make sure that we understand, uh, as you do, that freedom isn't free, that there are things that are worth fighting for. And uh, whether it's uh, you know Nazi tyranny or whether it's this uh, Islamic uh, jihad movement, uh, both of these are, are international uh, perils to the cause of freedom, and we need to we need to persevere in that effort. And here abroad, we've got uh, you know we've got common uh, enemies, I think, as as well. The, the folks uh, on the the big government left are continuing to uh, uh, stake out a course uh, for this nation that is. Uh, undermines what our founders put in place 231 years ago uh, that um, is destined to lead us down a road that is uh, uh, that will create a different America I think than we uh, have enjoyed uh, for a long time we've got a lot of battles you've got uh, the media you've got the Hollywood left uh, and you've got universities that all seem to be uh, in the in the cultural uh, elites that are on the left that um, uh, that uh, have a whole different message than, uh, than you and I have and that you're learning here at the Leadership uh, Institute. And so I guess that's all to say that we've really got to continue to be inspired uh, for the cause of freedom and, and limited uh, government if we're going to, to win. And despite these recent elections, and uh, I'm very, uh, still very heartbroken at the loss of our friend Jay O'Brien. He is one of the terrific leaders. He and I got elected the same year in 91. He's just done terrific work uh, for the people of Virginia for 16 years. And uh, I know Jay's not done yet. Uh, but this year was, was unusual in many ways uh, with um, some of the issues that affected uh, people's votes in Virginia really being colored by either the war in Iraq or the Bush's uh, popularity ratings or abuser fees or other national issues that must, may not necessarily have had much to do with Virginia. But I think the message is, and I'm sure Jay said this, is we've just got to make sure that we don't uh, separate ourselves from the traditional principles uh, that have led to the growth of the Republican Party uh, in Virginia over the last uh, 25 or so uh, years. Uh, it took 130 years for Republicans to have any say in Virginia government. That only happened in 1997. And over the last 10 years, the terrific record of the Republicans in being able to uh, fight uh, crime and reform welfare and improve our standards of education and a number of other things have got us to be the most prosperous business state in the country, uh, the best managed state in the country, the best place in America to raise a child, all recent accolades that I could trace directly to Republican and conservative initiatives. So it's not time to run from it. It's time to articulate those, uh, but do it in a way that particularly in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads where we've been Taken, uh, taken a little bit of a beating at the polls. I grew up up here, and I lived the last 21 years in Virginia Beach, so I know the area as well. We've got to talk about it in terms of uh, the conservative approach to these quality of life issues on education, transportation, environment, uh, health care, public safety. There's a clear message to be delivered. Uh, but we got to do what Reagan did, and that is you can't do it and hope the media gets it right. you got to go directly to the people, directly with the grassroots efforts to convince people uh, that our vision and um, our ideas uh, lead to a better uh, Virginia and better opportunity and more freedom and more, uh, more opportunities to grow wealth uh, than the views of the other side that's big government, more government programs and government solutions to most, most things. I think we can do that, and I think that we just need continued energetic uh, messengers to deliver that, and you are them. So uh, I don't uh, want to carry on much longer because I know that all of you have got uh, traffic going back to where you work. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate 
uh, having the opportunity to be the Attorney General of Virginia. We've got uh, a lot done on a host of issues dealing with homeland security and regulatory reform. I'm trying to cut the 24,000 pages of regulations uh, dramatically in Virginia to create more freedom for people and uh, get rid of those hidden taxes that uh, unbur unduly burdensome regulations are. Uh, improve internet safety. Those are just some of the things that we've we've worked on. But you know, looking ahead, we've got challenges to cut spending. We've doubled the budget in 10 years in Virginia. We've got uh, problems with uh, illegal immigrants committing violent crimes in Virginia. No help from the federal government. No help from the governor. Uh, we're going to try to do some things uh, this year. Jay would have been a terrific ally, and I know he'll still speak on those. Uh, those uh, those issues, and then we've got to continue to improve homeland security, bring some choice into education, and uh, continue to uh, uh, fight for the traditional values that have made this a great nation. So let me just close by saying I'm, I really apologize again, Morton, to you and to the team here for for being late. I thought doubling the uh, traffic time was going to be plenty, but uh, Lawyers Road was literally closed. That's what you that's what you get for naming a road after a lawyer. It's a, <laughs> It's just a mess, and so I um, apologize for being late. I look forward to coming back and talking to you. I'll be around for just a little bit if, uh, if I, any of you want to talk. But God bless you, and thanks for what you do for the conservative cause and the cause of freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we've had a, a, a double treat here, uh, and uh, I want to say... I know in behalf of everybody, Jay, your presentation here, extemporaneous, was was both philosophically sound and, and eloquent, and uh, it's just hard to imagine that you could lose an election, I t tell you. The truth is, you're just wonderful, and we, and we thank you. And Bob, we, uh, we're sorry for the, for the problems, but uh, we're fair-minded. You did come, <laughs> and, uh, and you did speak, and you got an Adam Smith tie. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I invite you, uh, please, to uh, join us here uh, next month. Uh, ordinarily, we meet on the first Wednesday, but the first Wednesday being January 2nd, it, we thought it was impractical uh, to do that. So our uh, Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast next month will be on January 9th, and I hope to see you uh, then. Um, I recall that uh, you have available to you as you reach the elevator area out there uh, a stack of our list of uh, the 27 prominent and outrageous abuses of the left on college campuses, the list called How Low Can Higher Education Go? You're welcome to uh, take one of those as you go out. Uh, those of you who would like a tour of the Leadership Institute should... Uh, um, meet here uh, at the conclusion of the breakfast. You'll depart immediately on a tour. Brenda Alves, Brenda, where are you? There she is. Brenda uh, will be uh, leading the tour for those of you who are who are interested. And and I don't think touring is going to uh, um, uh, enable you to to miss the bad weather. It's it's supposed to snow off and on through most of the day, but we'd be happy to have you here in a nice long tour of the uh, Leadership Institute, and uh, and maybe some of the traffic snares that are now existing will be cleared up by the time you go on your way. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming.